What's up, y'all? We back with another episode of Define Your Legacy. All right, I'm your host, Theus Elijah McB, and we have Bilal on the show. What's going on, man? How you doing? I'm doing well, man. How are you? Happy Monday. Thank you, man. Appreciate Happy it. Happy Thursday. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, so if you could, <laughs> man, just introduce yourself um, and tell us a little bit about who you are and what it is that you do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I give you my story. Um, my mom is from Ghana, father's from Nigeria, and I was born in Togo, West Africa. So if you're listening, you're from West Africa, you're my people, you're from Africa, you're my peoples. Uh, when I was born, my father actually left Togo uh, in a pursuit of a better life for our family. So for the first eight years of my life, I grew up with my mom, my sister in a patriarchal society. Um, and things are a little bit challenging. But when I was eight years old, we got that phone call. I was like, hey, man, like, we taking you to America. And, you know, come from Togo, Africa, right? Super small country. We thought we we're going to come to the U.S. We're going to see flying cars, beautiful parks. And we're gonna love the snow. That's not what happened. We ended up moving to uh, Hartford, Connecticut, which at the time was one of the top ten poor cities in the U.S. Um, so, needless to say, that there weren't any flying cars, and we did not like the snow. But came to Connecticut, um, eight years old, went to No Web's Elementary School for a couple of years, and what I saw at a young age is I saw my father start his own business. So he started his own trucking company, Mark Carrier LLC. Uh, still working to this day, 20 years later, uh, he's has like seven or eight employees. And what happened is he moved us from Hartford to Windsor, Connecticut. So it's a bit more suburbia than Hartford. And I realized how I was able to do that is through his business. So at a young age, it's plain to the sea that, hey, maybe I want to have my own business one day. So I went to middle school at in Windsor, high school at Windsor, typical African. We all play soccer and we're forced to go to college. <laughs> um, so when senior year came around I actually got recruited to go play soccer at UMass Dartmouth and I came home after the college visit and I told my family like oh I'm going to UMass Dartmouth the campus is sick the soccer team love me I'm going to recruit for the year it's going to be great and then my family sat me down and said hey we're glad that you want to go to college and that's a really good school but uh, we can't afford it and then that's when it hit me that I no longer want money to hinder me from whatever it is that I want in life so I started educating myself how to save, how to budget, investments, and insurance planning. And the decision that I made for college was I chose to go to Central Connecticut State University intentionally because I had accredited business school. I was able to get an academic and athletic scholarship to play soccer there at D1. And what my goal as a freshman was to land an internship. That was my one goal as a freshman because I realized that, hey, if I get an internship, that's a head start in my career. So the way I was actually able to land my internship as a freshman was because I intentionally hung around all the juniors and seniors. So you start to think my network, and I had no idea what I was doing. I just realized they get an opportunity, so hang out with them. So I ended up hanging out a bunch of the juniors and seniors, and I applied, I kid you not, bro, for like 20 internships, and they all said no. And then I was had my head down, I was walking to the cab, and my guy, Jason Hewitt, he pulled me to the side. He was like, yo, Blau, um, I think I got an internship for you. I was like, nah, stop playing with me. He says, listen, there's this company called Northwestern Mutual, and it's one of the top 10 internships in the entire U.S. It's been top 10 for the last 20 plus years in number one in financial services. And I want you to come to the Excel Center because UConn women's basketball team had a Final Four game and they rented out the director suite. And I want you to come with me. I'm like, bro, you're a senior. You have a 4.0 GPA. You're president of the accounting club. They want you. I'm a freshman. Right. Like I just finished my first semester. I got a three, seven, but still like you got a 4.0. Yeah. Like we're not on the same level. He was like, bro, just come anyway. I was like, cool. So I showed up to the XL center and I kid you not. I had on corduroy pants. I had on this oversized white dress shirt with my father's dress shirt. And I had on a tie for free tie day in high school. Mm -hmm. And everyone around me had on custom suits. I'm like, nah, this is crazy. Yeah. So then I just started networking. I was like, you know, screw this. I'm already here. I'm in the room. And I met Jody Culberstone. Shout out to her. She was the director of the internship program. She interviewed me, bro, five times. Mm. And the fifth interview, I was in my dorm room on campus. And she goes, hey, Bilal, uh, we'd love to extend you uh, an opportunity to join our summer internship program. And I was like, wait, say that one more time? <laughs> she says, hey, I uh, would love to extend you an opportunity to join the number one financial services internship in the entire country true story till this day i got so excited i hung up on her <laughs> and i ran out my dorm room and i started screaming like i did it i did it i did it and then i called her back and i was I like was hey, say, Jody, i think we got disconnected 
<laughs> and that's how I got started. So I'm a financial planner. I've been at Northwestern Mutual now for almost 10 years, uh, nine years. Started on 19. I'm 28 now. Uh, and that's that's my background story to what I do today. Okay. Well, okay. Well, so even in that nine year span, um, it's when you, when you obviously first got started, um, to now we're obviously tap into that, but I want to get to touch on the beginning part. Um, like even before you went to college, you said, right. And even as a freshman, um, you know, during your days in college, you mentioned how you were interested in learning and what sparked it. Um, but why did you decide to, to, to persevere with that and go through with that at such an early age? Yes. I mean, to me, it was like two major events happened in my life. One, not being able to go to the college of my choice. Uh, Central is a great program. I'm glad I went to Central and I had a great education. I'm where I am today because of Central. But I want to go to Dartmouth, right? And I couldn't go for money. So that happened. And also growing up in Togo, Africa, like we weren't rich. Like I slept in the same bedroom for the first eight years of my life with my mom and my sister. And I just realized that there has to be better. Like there has to be more. You start watching MTV Cribs, you start seeing all these things like, yo, listen, there has to be an opportunity bigger. And when I figured that, hey, the head start is going to be an internship. I said, perfect. I realized that juniors and seniors get it. Hang out with them. I didn't think I was going to be a financial advisor. Like, I can't write that script for you. Like, that's not what I thought. I just know I want to be successful. And I had no idea what it looked like, but I was trying to piece together the puzzle of what that could potentially be. And I think some luck, I've seen hard work and determination help, but I think some luck played a role in that for me to be where I am today. I'm very grateful for it. Hmm. Let me ask you something, though. Going off that, did you think yeah. success was possible? Like, because because there, I feel yeah. like there's a lot of people who might be going through a similar situ- situation, but they don't believe slash they didn't see anything else close to them, right? To make them really understand that like it's it's possible to reach you know a certain level. Yeah, um, I, I I literally had a conversation with my barber today. I got a first step. Um, I had a conversation with my barber today, and we were talking about just optics and how important it is for people in our community to see something else that's not an athlete or a rapper and i remember that when i was in elementary school i probably remember like one or two teachers the one i'll never forget is mr tucker mr tucker was this black bald head man and i'll always remember mr tucker from wait, Noel webster and, wait hold on do you wait hold on do you remember his first name uh i could find out mr tucker's first name i just always call him mr tucker I don't all right, t- all right we, we might have to talk on the side <laughs> then because I, I i know mr tucker that was black and bald we might Okay. Oh, yeah, we might know the same person, which is crazy. <laughs> but yeah. 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 Go ahead, go ahead. We, it might be the same person. Yeah. Maybe. Um, I'd love to reconnect with them. Um, and then the <laughs> second person I had that was a black bald head man was Coach Wilson. Mr. Wilson at in was high school. He was my marketing uh teacher. Hmm. And it's like I'm starting to see guys like that. And I'm like, okay, so black men do wear suits. Hmm. And I remember um Miss Defoe and Miss McGovern also at uh Central, uh Miss Wellington. Um, and Mr. Foe at uh, Windsor, and these were two black women that said, hey, like, you should go become an accountant, become an accountant, become an accountant. So when I went to college, my major was accounting. And the only reason why my major is accounting was because the two black women that believed in me, Mr. Wellington and Mr. Foe, said, hey, you got A's in accounting, you should become an accountant, you're going to have a pretty good life. And my father said, hey, we just want you to have a good life. So I thought, hey, let me get a job. Let me get a salary. Don't start your business. Like, just get a job. An account is going to be very secure for you. And I'm glad I did it. And I started to get courage after my first semester. I'm like, I don't like accounting, but I like finance. So I ended up switching to finance, which worked out pretty well for me. Yeah, I would, you know, I would say, you know, salute, salute. Um, but what did it mean to you, though, to have two people um, or, you know, people like that kind of support you early on? And how do you, and how do you think that kind of played a role to where you're at now? I mean, it's very, very influential. I think without those people in my life, I don't know where I'd be. Right? And, and this is what I always say. I feel like there's some aspect of life that has to be lucky, where I just can't say that I'm 28 years old now, running my own business, and I'm from Togo, Africa, right, in the U.S. Like, the odds of that happening, like, slim to none. Yeah. Or right? I had to work for it. But I think we have to realize, say, what's an opportunity in front of you and what's something I could fully take advantage of? Hmm. Yeah. So I think everyone has someone in their life, right? That might be just a positive voice and just continue surrounding yourself with that positive voice. And that might just elevate you to somewhere. And I have no idea where that's going to be, but hopefully it's what you want. Right. And I think too, you know, people just have to understand that it's doable, you know, you know, based off my previous question before, like, you know, believing that you can really, you know, become successful in that area. 
Um, but even, you know, moving past that, right, um, you know, we talked about, you know, high school days and middle school days, um, your freshman year of college. But talk to me about the growth um, from your freshman year of college, you know, when you were wearing the, 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 the corduroy pants <laughs> high, to, to, to then becoming a senior. Right? Because cause the one thing, too, that I want to highlight about that moment um, that you talked about being a freshman was that you took that chance. Right. And so regardless mm-hmm. of where someone is in life, taking that chance, um, betting on yourself, if you will, is, is extremely important. So talk to me about the growth between your freshman year to, you know, senior year. Yeah. Uh, by the time I was a senior, all my shirts had my initials on it. Mm. So it was mm. great progression from freshman year to senior year. And what changed, it obviously came with, with confidence. And now I'm in a company where when I look up, I know zero broke financial advisors, like zero. Mm. I don't know a single broke financial advisor in Northwestern Mutual, like none. Mm. Like there's no one that I saw that was there five or 10 years that was broke. So like, you know what? This might turn out pretty all right. And they told me that if you stay with the company for five years, you have like a 90, 95% chance of retiring with the company. Mm. So, okay, so that's job security. So it just means that the first five years are going to be a grind. And it's like anything else, right? Everything is a grind. I mean, I think college four years is a grind, but if you want to go get an advanced degree, get your MBA, you get your JD, get your MD, you're still going to be grinding. Mm-hmm. And even when you're done, your first couple of jobs that you get, you're still grinding to get to that next level. So for me, I just look at it and say, hey, you know what? What do I have to do? What's the system that I have to follow? And I'm just going to follow the system. And that's mm-hmm. exactly what I decided to do. Um, there's an interesting story about betting on myself that actually happened my um, my senior year. So my sophomore year, the sem- uh, semester ago for my freshman or sophomore year, that's when I got the internship. My sophomore year was horrible. Like, I, I really didn't do nothing. They should have fired me. Yeah. But the reason why they didn't is because I just kept trying. And they saw that. I was always early in the office. I stayed late. So they said, you know what? We'll give it another shot. And my junior year, everything changed. So then headed to my senior year, um, this is funny. You had Lauren in your episode. I actually brought Lauren into the business. Yeah. But the backstory to that, uh, so you had your posse from Lauren. I kind of had a little influence on that, so I feel good. Um, oh, respect, respect. What, what? <laughs> there we go. It all, it all comes full circle. It all comes full circle, yeah. Yeah, so when my junior year to senior year, um, I was part of Inroads. I don't know if you're, you're familiar with Inroads. Yep, 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 yep. Yep, so I was part of Inroads because I wanted an internship. And the Inroads called me. When I was into my senior year, they said, hey, um, we got an internship for you. Um, it's at Travelers. And I was like, what? I got an internship at Travelers? I was like, yeah. I was like, how much they pay? It's the question everybody love me. asking. It's the question everybody I love asking. I got to know. They said, we're going to pay you $18 an hour, 40 hours a week, and we're going to pay your tuition. I mm. said, What? <laughs> so you're gonna be a traveler you're gonna be a traveler's ed scholar baby i'm like all right cool. that, that sounds beautiful and i sat there and i was like you know what maybe i shouldn't continue running my own business mm. maybe i should leave and just go and get a job because it's everything that everyone told me you want security right i want to make sure i have a consistent paycheck coming in right i don't have to ever worry about commission right it's business right every business it's sales where it's like you don't have to worry about the ups and downs, you get with a consistent paycheck, and you could just be fine. And you know, if I would have become a traveler's edge scholar, I was guaranteed six figures. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think there's anyone that's a traveler's edge scholar that stayed at travelers until they're 30, they don't make six figures. Yeah. So, I, I feel like I had my ticket written for me, but I, I don't know. I just think, like, I was thinking at the time, I wanted more than that, I, I wanted control of my life. And to me, that was so important. So, I ended up telling travelers, no. And the reason why I'm so successful, I think, right, and their definition of success yeah. at Northwestern is, is because I felt like I just burned that bridge and I had to make this work. Like I had no other opportunity. Like I just turned down $18 an hour, 40 hours a week, free tuition as a senior. Tuition, yeah, yeah, yeah. To literally bet on myself. So it had to work. Mm. It had to work. And it ended up working out. So I'm, I'm super grateful. That yeah, 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 yeah. So talk to me, though. Um, Because obviously, you know, it's easy, right, when we talk about, um, you know, looking ahead that you made the right decision. Like, it's easy to say that now, right? But was there times where you doubted that decision and or yourself? 
early on. Yes. Not now, but early on. Yeah. Yeah. There are definitely times where I doubted myself. Um, there are times where I felt like quitting. I, I probably quit, I kid you not, 10 to 20 times my first year out of college in the business, but no one knew that. Right. It's optics. Right. I had to have this image of, hey, I have everything together. And and I knew that, right? Even even early on, I, I said that by the time I was a senior, my shirts had like my initials on it. But that was intentional because you can't be a broke financial advisor, mm. right? No one's a broke financial advisor. So what I ended up doing was I made some sacrifices to make sure that I could have this image. And the image worked. The image worked, but it was scary at times, right? It was scary at times that I made phone calls and people were like, bro, I don't want to buy life insurance bro, I don't care about investing money right now. Bro, just leave me alone. I just want to travel. I want to go to Miami. I want to live my life. Yeah. Like, I don't care about my finances right now. Like, and it was just that constant, no, no, no. It took me three years to make my father a client. Mm, and we yeah. live in the same house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was that constant rejection and having to overcome that. But the reason why I never gave up is because I had a vision of what my future is going to look like. My first day of my internship, I thought it was the corniest thing in the world. And they made us do a vision board. Like, let's say the first day, I was excited. I showed up, I had a suit. My father bought me a suit. I had a suit, I had my tie on. I sat in the front. I was super excited. I'm going to take notes. I'm like, all right, I got to learn my stocks, bonds, ETFs. I got to learn all this stuff, how to trade, how to do all this. What is insurance? What does that fit? And they said, hey, uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to actually uh, create your vision board. Hmm. I said, what? We're doing a vision board today? I was like, yeah. So we're going to figure out where do you see yourself in the like next zero to three years, three to seven years, and seven plus years from now. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> and this spent so much time talking. I was like, where's the stock tip? Like, mm-hmm. where's the hot tip? Like I, I'm, like, I need to learn that. Yeah. And it's so funny. I sat there and I came back the next day. I'm like, all right, here it is. This a, a wow. That's not what you asked you for. Mm-hmm. You have a binder. Mm-hmm. We need you to go find pictures on Google and put pictures next to these vision boards and all these things that you want. God. I'm like, come on. So <laughs> I spent my time, I did it. I showed it the next day and I have my vision board laid out. I have my zero to three years of all things I want to accomplish. I have pictures on it. And I fast forward, so that was when I was 19. I fast forward five years from there, mm-hmm. uh, from then. I was 24 years old. I just bought my first house. Okay. And I'm cleaning out my, my house. And then I go under my bed and I found this binder when I was 19 years old. And I'm like, that's really interesting. And then I look at my vision of everything that I said I was gonna do, and I checked every single thing off. Mm. And it gave me chills. Mm. And it gave me chills. That's scary. So to think about why I did not give up is because I think internally, when you write certain things down, it literally stays in your subconscious, which is way more powerful than when you're intentionally trying to think about something. And I think that stayed in there. And also have people that believe in me. At times I left an office and I was crying. No one knew this. I left and I was crying because I was just so just, I don't know, but like I was giving up. Mm-hmm. And I had Mrs. Yvonne Mito that told me like, it's going to be all right. Like, it's okay. It's okay to be the only black intern that you guys have. Um, you're going to make it out all right. And that's part of the reason why Larry ended up joining because I realized I was the only black person. I'm like, I got to change this. Mm-hmm. So I brought Larry on and I brought a bunch of people on. At one point, you probably felt it. It felt like everybody had a job at Northwest because mm-hmm. I was trying to bring everybody in. Because I felt like it provided me such a wonderful opportunity. I want to experience that with other people. And I also felt lonely. So I was going to build my own team. And that's part of the stuff that led me there. So part of me not giving up is that when you bring other people in that believe in you, it's hard to give up. Hmm. I, I'm not, I, don't, I don't have any kids, but I imagine it would be tough for me to come home and tell my kids, like, hey, I'm sorry, I can't pay the bill today. Because hmm. I showed up late to work. Like, I'm showing up on time. I'm going to be early. I'm going to perform better to make sure my family's okay. Hmm. So I think you have other people start depending on you. When people start trusting me, it was, hey, like, I'm going to be all right with my finances, right? Like, when I retire, you're going to be there, right? Like, when I buy my house, you're going to be there, right? Mm-hmm. When that stuff starts to happen, I can't give up. So that just kept me going. Yeah. But, you know, that's that's impact. And to me, like, again, this is why I say the show is titled Define Your Legacy and the word money isn't into it. Because, you know, you could have just kept going by yourself, right? You could have just said, all right, you know, I'm going to keep, you know, trading along and just I'm going to be good but you brought other people with you, right? You introduced others, you know, to, to, to the, uh, to the industry. Um, but so now, right. We talked about, you know, the, again, the middle school, the high school, college days, um, the senior year, 
talk to me about what you started to do with North, Northwestern after you graduated from college and, and, and to now. Yeah, so the thing that I appreciate about the opportunity was they literally gave me a career in entrepreneurship. Mm. Um, and that's what they gave me. But, excuse me. So now, just to clarify, so Northwestern Mutual is the, the big mothership that creates all the insurance and all the investment products, right? To, to the left of me, really, so that's on the right. To the left of me, you're going to have Northwestern Mutual, Connecticut, and now Northwestern Mutual, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I've moved. Um, but you have those as my oversight. But in the middle, you have Bilal and my team, and we're the ones that provide the client experience. Mm. So all they have Northwestern is really my practice that I control. Mm. So when I think about my life today, I'm excited because I have clients that I had from the beginning that are buying homes, they're getting married. Um, I was just in San Diego last week, um, my lady Ali and I, and we saw Sonny and Crystal and we saw their crib. And Sonny's one of my clients and we spoke about him buying a house. And it's like, I'm here now. Hmm. Right? It's something we planted to seize on years ago. Or hmm. like Larry now, the career didn't work out for him, but now he's at, he's at Goldman. Mm-hmm. Right? It's like, it was like just being able to have that type of impact and just starting to see it. It literally like, it just it makes me feel so happy and thrilled about life. Mm-hmm. But the thing that continues to make me continue to go is, is just the impact. I want to be able to send my, my clients' kids to college. I want my clients to be able to stop working and just travel. Uh, one of my clients three weeks ago, uh, she called me on a Tuesday and she says, hey, Bilal, uh, I'm going to put a roof for the next three days and I'm going to spend $3,000. And I said, congratulations. And I was so happy for her because she worked so hard to get to where she's at. And she's like, I'm going to go below three grand in Peru. I was like, mm-hmm. you should definitely do that. And the reason why she's okay doing that is because the rest of her financial plan is going to work. Mm-hmm. She's still going to be able to buy the house that she wants to. She still has her cash flow coming in regardless of what happens. to her. She's still on track to retire when she wants to. So now it's okay to live your life. So all this impact and those financial planning is so people can spend their, their life doing the things that they love to do. Mm. That's the reason why I continue doing what I do today. Mm. It's because of that impact so people can live their best lives. Yeah. So when, when we talk about financial planning and, 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 you know, her being able to go on vacation and stuff, what would you say you prioritize when it comes to a client? And obviously, for the record, everyone's situation is different, right? So I'm sure, you know, it all depends on, you know, everything, right? There's different factors. But whether it's increasing income, insurance, um, savings, emergency fund, is it like a, a little bit of everything or, or does it based off the specific person? Yeah, it, it depends on a specific person. But every conversation starts with a vision. Mm. Right? I literally treat everyone like my first day of my internship. So everyone comes like, oh, you got a stock tip for me. I'm talking to my financial advisor. He's going to let me know when to buy Bitcoin. Oh, uh, God, God. Don't, get started, started, <laughs> don't get me started, man. Don't get me started, man. He's going to the stock that's going to blow up, the S&P. He's going to tell me all that stuff. And the first thing we talk about is like, where are you today? And where do you see yourself in the next three, five years, 10 years from now, where do you see yourself going? And they're like, actually, this is the things that I want. And the most powerful thing is when you sit down with someone three years later, five years later, 10 years later, and you literally pull up what they said day one, and you could cross the things off and say they did those things. Yeah. And you just literally, I can't take credit that I did it, right? Because you can literally tell me, go pound stand, I'm not saving money. Like, it's your money at the end of the day. Right, right, right. All I was really here for is really just to coach you along the way of, hey, here are things you need to do to make sure you're okay. Yeah. Right. We have clients where, I had a client where I think was it probably like middle of last year. I mean, the market did great, not taking yeah, yeah, credit. Right, right. <laughs> but she, <laughs> all right, she invested 100000 with me. And then we spoke a year later. I was like, you made $45,000. She's like, wait, what? She's like, I didn't do anything. I was like, exactly. Mm-hmm. And she was just blown away by that. But that was just an opportunity that I was fortunate enough to literally just have a front, like literally front row seat to the things that she wants to accomplish. And I had a couple of clients that bought RVs in the pandemic. And we send them money from our investment account to buy RVs. Because I'm they, not mad they, they don't want to travel, they want to live. That's what it's all about. It's like, what do you want? So when I meet with the client, the first step is, what do you want? Right, that, that scene from the notebook, like, what do you want? Like, ultimately, what do you want? Do you want to educate your kids? Do you want to buy a home next year, two years from now? Like, what do you want? And once we understand what you want, we just going to create a financial roadmap for you to really get there. Mm. Because what happens is if people don't meet with myself and my team, they have an idea of where they want to go. But it's like me being in Pittsburgh, say, I'm going to visit sunny in San Diego. 
I have an idea. Like, I'm going west. Eventually, I'm going to find my way to San Diego. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if I had a map, I'll get there a lot faster. Yeah, it'd be a lot easier. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. You just so got that's a, that financial plan. Yeah, you just got to uh, plan it all out. Um, but even going off that, though, like, so your clients, right? What would you say is the biggest difference mm-hmm. that you've noticed between the, 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 the first day yet that you met with them versus where they are, let's say, a year or two? And I'm not even talking about financially, but just whether it's mindset or just overall their approach towards life or whatever. Have you noticed a difference in that? Yeah. Um, our clients, they stay married. Um, wow. Wow. That's, you know, that's, that's dope that you started off that answer like that. That Wow. All right. <laughs> I'm not mad at it. It's okay. <laughs> I'm not mad at it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. No, clients that talk about money together are just happier because they understand what's happening right if you have spouses that aren't talking about money or to me the most shocking thing is like you're gonna marry someone you don't know what they have for student loans it's like it's like i'm blown away it's like how could you possibly do that right you're gonna know everything else about them and not their finances it doesn't work um our clients tend to be happier our clients tend to travel more and enjoy life more and our clients tend to educate their kids a lot more. Mm. We had a client today that sent us an email. Um, and I actually, I can't take credit for this. My team did this. I have my team where the Connecticut Higher Education Trust, Chet, uh, they had a program for all the people in the state of Connecticut. And I had them email all of our clients with kids. And a couple of our clients really got free money because they applied for it. Other people aren't thinking about this, nor do they have other people thinking about them this way to even take action on this. So now they just bought their kids a couple of books for college. So those are the differences. And the first thing is when we meet, the biggest barrier is going to be trust. Mm. Because money is a taboo. We don't talk about money in our society. Just our communities in general, we don't talk about money, right? Well, people talk about politics in public before anyone tells you how much money they have in their bank account. All no the- one's going to say much money having a bank account, their foreign k but they'll talk all day about Trump, Biden. They'll talk about sex. They'll talk about everything. Everything. Every, every, literally everything. Everything. Food, sports, politics, religion. Everything. Everything. No. Like, no. So when they have that first meeting, it's like, wow, like I'm actually telling someone all this information about my finances and my vision for the future. So I, first, the biggest thing is to literally build that trust and that relationship with them. But then once that happens and they trust you, you're fine. Are are you able to say, I guess, like the average age of a client or is is there, I guess, a a minimum or or, or I guess maximum sounds a little wild, but can someone play this? Can someone be too young um, to, you know, get their finances right? No, no, you can't. You can't be too young to get your finances right. Um, Again, I started out at 19. Yeah, I think I insured so many people at Central and UConn. It was literally absurd. Oh, um, <laughs> run it up, run um, it up, run so, it up, run it up. <laughs> yeah, but it was for all the right reasons uh, um, because a lot of people stay out with Fosse's till this day and they're so happy they got it. And the best part about it, they can't replicate it. Mm. They can't replicate it anymore mm. because they're older and their health change and all that stuff. So at the time, like I had no idea the impact I was having. I was just told, hey, do this and everything's going to be all right. So I just kept doing it. But you're not too young to get a financial advisor. Get one as early as possible. Um, I did this. I want to call him like my my lab test. Like, I don't know what you call him. Um, <laughs> but I remember one of my guys, I'm going to keep his name out of it. He might be okay with it, but I'm going to keep his name out of it. Um, he, he reached out to me when he was a sophomore in college. We went to the same high school. And he goes, well, I'm going to be a client. I'm like, bro you're a sophomore and this, this is me right like just hindsight i was 22 23 years old and i'm thinking oh my clients are now like they're retiring they make so right. much more money now like you're in college with an internship like you don't have much money for us to talk about but i say you know what? i got in this business to help people so i say you know what let's let's get it so i end up meeting with him he gave me his entire vision first thing we do every single meeting and when he got his first job before he took out, I was like, no, you got to go back and renegotiate. It's just like all these tiny little things where I just became more of like a, a mentor type of relationship. But this is my guy. I'm so proud of this kid. He's not a kid. I'm proud of this man. Yeah, um, right, 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 right. <laughs> so proud of this man. And then by the time he was 23, I think, or 22, he bought his first house. 
Mm. And he just continues saving over 50% of his paycheck. And he started at like 18, 19, 19, 20 years old with the financial advisor. Now, this is a guy who literally, I kid you not, he's going to be financially independent by the time he's in his 40s or 50s. Like, it's just for sure it's going to happen. If it doesn't happen, he screwed up big somewhere. <laughs> but even if he screwed up, we have so many guardrails around him that he'll still mm. recover. Mm. So it's never too late to get him. It's not too early to get an advisor. It's also not too late. Um, one of my success stories is I met one of my best friend's mom when she was 48 years old. She had a couple hundred dollars in her name and her goal is to buy a house in like 10 years. I'm like, you're going to retire. I, we don't have that long for you to try to buy a house. Right, right, I say 10, yeah. I you not, <laughs> two, three years later, she, two or three years later, she bought her house. She went from mm. a couple hundred dollars in savings to two or three years buy her home at like 50 mm. or 51. I forgot what she was. So it's never too early. It's never too late. It's never too early and it's never too late. Like I, I'm, I'm big on perspective and context just because, you know, mm-hmm. so I think when people hear financial advisor, and I'm glad you just said that example. I think when people hear financial advisor, they think of like, well, if I don't have a lot of money, you know, I, I can't have a financial advisor. But to me, it's probably the exact opposite. You probably need one. Um, so what, what are like... Not, 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 not the exact opposite. Well, well um, maybe not exact opposite, but like, you know, well, when we talk about spending habits too, right? I think that comes into play. I think there has to be some sort of direction um, that, you know, comes into play. So um, what would you say, um, like, I guess, are the benefits of having a financial advisor, regardless of income? Yeah, the biggest benefit is someone like having a doctor is you have someone to check into and say, hey, you know what? I could Google this stuff, but I probably want to talk to somebody. All right. It's the same reason why you have a personal trainer if you're into that. All right. It's like, hey, you know what? I need someone to hold me accountable. It's you want to literally borrow somebody's brain. Mm. That's how I look at it. Wow. It's like this person study this stuff. They've been doing this for years. This is what they're passionate about. And I'm passionate about X, Y, and Z. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and just delegate this part of my life to this person. I'm going to check, you know, check and balances, make sure everything is right. Right, 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 right. But that's ultimately the biggest benefit because you're going to think about, hey, I plan on doing things one way. And it's also an advisor. I say, hey, you can still get to the same end goal, but you'll get it a lot faster and more efficient if you consider doing X, Y, and Z. Facts, 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 facts. So yeah. I'll give you, I'll give you, a, uh, I'll give you a, uh, a easy one um, where in the beginning, I think this, everyone should be doing this. Uh, well, pause. Financial advice. I can't say that. Not everyone should be doing <laughs> I was about to say, hey, man. I, hey, listen. I say this is not financial advice all the time. But I don't think I would have to right. tell you to say that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. So I can't. I can't say that. I could. I could make an argument. Okay. That okay. If you're under the age of, if you're under the age of forty-five, depending on income, uh, that you are better off doing a Roth four hundred one k if offered than doing a traditional four hundred one k. And there's it's a very small difference between traditional four hundred one k and a Roth four hundred one k. So you have a Roth IRA. You've heard of that, or even a traditional IRA. Mm-hmm. So the difference is, let's stay a little bit higher. So whenever you hear a thing with a four, it just means you get it through your employer. So 401k, 403b, 457, it means you get it through your employer. Okay. IRA stands for Individual Retirement Account, IRA. So it means your employer can't give you an IRA, mm. right? You can't say, oh, I work at Cigna, Raytheon, Apple, Google, and I have an IRA. You can't. Right. You have a four, something that starts with a four. So 401k or 403b or 457. Right. And then you have two words, one that is raw, R-O-T-H, and then traditional. Here's the difference. So traditional means it is pre-tax. Pre-tax meaning you don't pay tax on this money. So if you make 100000 a year and you put $6,000 into a traditional insert, IRA, 401k, 403b, 457, whatever you want to insert, as long as it's traditional, you take 100,000 minus your contribution of six, so you're down to 94. When it is tax time, your income is going to be $94,000. And we live in a progressive tax system, supposedly. The more you make, the more you pay. <laughs> <laughs> right? So that's traditional. And then you have raw. R-O-T-H. So you have a Roth, insert, IRA, 
401k, 403b, 457. This means you do not get a deduction. You make 100,000, you put a 6,000, when it's taxed on, you still made 100,000. Right? That's it. Yeah. So it's not that exciting today. Here's where the benefits come with. Both of those accounts, they end up growing. All right, they just end up growing. And then eventually you retire. <laughs> and when you retire, you want to take the money out now. That's the reason why you put the money away in the first place, is to use it in the future. Travel, live life, donate to charity, whatever you want to do. So when you start taking the money out, remember traditional, you did not pay any tax on the front end. So on the back end, you're going to have Uncle Sam doing the Birdman hand. Yep. hand Knock on that ready door. Money. Knock on that door. Knocking on that door. That's exactly what's going to happen. And, or you have the Roth. When now when you take it out, you pay zero tax. Mm. So the argument is, when I retire, I'll be in a lower tax bracket. And my response to that is, you really, you just might be. I don't know. Mm. You really just might be. Mm. But where the difference is going to come from is most of the money in that account doesn't even come from your contributions. It comes from the growth in the account. So would you rather, if you're a farmer, would you rather pay taxes on your seeds or your harvest? Or another way that I look at it is imagine you walk into a bank and you say, hey, I want to borrow some money. They say, oh, great. You have a great credit score. Awesome. Here, here's the money that you want. And then you walk in and I say, wait, wait, what's the interest rate? And then say, hey, don't worry about it. We'll tell you when you, when you come back. Are you accepting that? <laughs> 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 like what <laughs> why would you borrow money and not know the interest rate mm. so you're, if you're doing traditional you put money away but you have no idea what the tax rate is going to be in the future yeah you have no idea or you, you know what it is today and you'll never pay taxes again yeah i don't know so my argument is if you're younger i'm thinking 45 is the cutoff where depending on income 45 and under i can make an argument where the Roth insert is gonna be better for you than the traditional. So what I see in practice all the time is someone says, Hey, I'm saving 10% into my 401k. So great. Is it a traditional 401k or a Roth 401k? They typically respond with, I don't know. Is that okay? Well, let's look at your benefits. Do you have a Roth 401k offered? And say, Yeah, okay, let's switch it. So go inside of your portal, that traditional, put it at zero, and the Roth, put it at 10%. Simple switch, but now when you retire, you pay no tax. Yeah. You just got literally got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars from that simple little switch. But the default is traditional. Yeah. I don't know. A lot. No, no, no. I'm I'm, I'm with you. Numbers wise, I'm with you. I'm I just wanted you to okay. make sure you explain it to, to the audience. I'm I'm with you. Um, <laughs> especially on the, the Roth IRA and traditional IRA. I think you know, as of uh what the 2021 max being um, $6,000, right? And like, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of it being tax-free, I guess, you know, on, on the Roth IRA side, once you hit retirement, I think like 59 and a half, um, you know, there's, you know, certain advantages um, to that. Uh, but the thing is, though, too, um, and I don't know if you can say this, but I'm going to say it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and like, you have to, at least in the Roth, like, you have to invest it, right? So, like, if you put money into that account, like, it has to go into like right an ETF or a stock or or, or 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 something, right? Like it's not just a simple. All right, it's not like it's a savings account. We're like it, it could be a savings account. It can't it can't be a savings account. So it doesn't necessarily have yeah. to be like well, I'm like in order for it to grow like you know the the ten percent return or whatever, it has to be invested into something, right? Yeah, it has to be invested for sure. Yeah, like anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I yeah. think you're you're probably getting, you're probably getting an alternative something else. What's the alternative? Is there an alternative? No, 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 no. The reason why I say that is because it's almost like you know I feel that there's some people when they hear open up a Roth IRA, they open up an IRA and put it into an account, but they just like let it sit there slash they don't choose an investment, right? Like like they don't choose I've a stock that. that they invest in. Like it's just it's just there. Which I mean, depending on who you are, that's a good thing. But you know, you still have to decide. Like here's what I want to invest in. Right. Like even if you just I've seen that, you know, again, not advice, but if you just put like to an ETF or whatever over and over again, that's still a decision. Like it can't just sit there. Like there has no, to be just OK. Yeah. Yeah. Literally just put the money in motion. And when you send the money away, it's going to come back with friends. 
Ah, oh, okay. All right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> Again, y'all, you know, it's not advice, of course. But um, yeah, just throw, just throw it out there um, and just let it. But I do think that's important, though. I mean, you mentioned the age of 45, um, but just, you know, young adults, um, if you can, you know, you know, the Roth IRA and, and Roth for all, all the things that you mentioned. Um, and these are actual um, opportunities that are, you know, available, um, you know, for people just, you know, make sure you do your research. But you talked about retirement accounts. But another thing that I wanted to mention um, was life insurance, life insurance, life insurance, life, life insurance. Um, now, retirement. Now, my thing is my my uh, my feeling towards all this. Right. Is re- when we hear retirement accounts, I think a lot of people think, well, you know, I got what four decades that I retire. Like, I'm not trying to think about that. Um, and I guess mathematically, I disagree with that. But I understand why someone who's 22 doesn't care about life at 60. I understand that. Um, but I want to talk to you about life insurance because everybody, I hate to say it, the reality is I don't care how old you are, how healthy you are, nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow, right? You, you can tell me that, you know, all right, I got 40 years, so I'm 60, but nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. So life insurance, could you explain to me just, um, you know, an intro or basics to someone um, life insurance? Yeah. So life insurance 101. What life insurance is, is you're literally getting a bag of cash that somebody else receives when you pass away tax-free. That's all it is. It's a bag of cash that is tax-free. So when you talk about legacy, 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 um, I can't help but think about my personal life. And remember I mentioned earlier, my father has a trucking business, mm-hmm. Mark Curry LLC. He does pretty well, eight employees, trucking business. Right? Mm-hmm. He does all right. Um, and one of the things that he said to me is that, hey, Bilal, I want you to take over the trucking business. And I said, hey, dad, no. <laughs> he says, <laughs> he says, no, like, it's a, it's a really good business. Like, it, it's very profitable. And I was like, dad, I love you. I love you. But there's no way mm. I'm running a trucking company. I have no interest to run a trucking company. Mm. And then the next thing that we're doing is now is real estate. So in Windsor, we actually own three properties across two streets in Windsor. So we're building up the real estate portfolio. Wow, run it up. And remember, I told you, I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania now. So I was like, hey, I'm going to keep buying more real estate. And when I go, you can have the real estate. I'm like, what if I'm in California? What if I'm somewhere else? What if I'm in Texas? Do I really want to worry about my property in Connecticut? Mm. Like, I, don't, I don't know. But dad, you know what I want? This is what I want a bag of cash that's tax-free. And then you know what provides that? Life insurance. Mm. So when you talk about legacy planning, I think we're missing the the point where we say, hey, we want to buy land. We want to buy, we want to start businesses. uh, We want to buy real estate and then pass that on to the next generation for legacy. Mm. You're missing the point. You're missing the boat. The best thing to leave behind. And I literally go tell and tell with anyone about this. It's life insurance. Mm. It's a bag of cash. It's tax free. Mm. That's all that it is. So when you start thinking about it, it's like, okay, if I would have received a bag of cash that's tax-free today, I personally think I could outperform the real estate properties out in Windsor. Or you know what I could do? I could just buy them here, mm. <laughs> right? Or whatever right. the business is worth, instead of me learning about the trucking business or having to sell it at a discount because I don't know how to operate the business or the trucks or anything about it, they get scammed out of whatever I could sell it. Just mm. give me the value of the, of the business in cash and let me decide what I want to do with it. Thanks. Because- my favorite way to make money is when I sleep and I wake up and I see my accounts are up. Mm. I do no work. I don't, I don't worry about tenants. I have real estate properties. I don't worry about tenants. I have a business, but I don't want to worry about speaking to another client. Like, I don't want to worry about anything. I just want the money to keep coming in. And that's what life insurance provides. Mood. So Mood. whenever you keep talking about legacy, 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 think about life insurance. Yes. But yes. to continue on that, the way life insurance is priced is based on your age and your health. The younger you are, the cheaper it is. The healthier you are, the cheaper it is. So theoretically, the best time for you to have life insurance is when you're born. That's really the best time to buy life insurance. Damn. So I remember when I was 19 years old, and I talked to someone that's like 21, 22, 20 years old, 23, 25. Like, I don't need life insurance. I want to wait until I'm married, I have a house, and I have kids. That's typically when people buy life insurance. The average age of a new client uh, for insurance companies is 31. Awesome. Why? At 31, people are getting married, buying homes, having kids. That's really the best thing about life insurance. The challenge is there are plenty of people 
that never made it to age 31 mm. that should have had life insurance. And the other thing is your health. And when it comes to your health, is simply glitches happen. All the little it takes is you going to your doctor and say, oh, slight diabetic, slight high blood pressure. Uh, pre-diabetic, I mean, slight high blood pressure. Uh, you have some slight issue now. Now, insurance company is going to look at you and be like, oh, my God, I, you can't insure this person. So now you're uninsurable. And now you're married, you have a house, you have kids. Where are you going to get this lump sum of money for to continue the cash flow that your family will miss out on? God forbid something happens to you. Yeah. So ultimately, life insurance, get it as soon as possible. Yes, there is probably the best time for you to buy life insurance. Yeah. Um, especially too, like if a person um, has children, right? Because obviously, you know, you, oh, yeah. you, you, you want to. I think, yeah, we said that the red flag viral. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it was uh, if he has kids and he doesn't have any life insurance, that's a red flag. Yeah, and vice versa, for the record. <laughs> and vice versa. It takes two that to go. And vice versa. It, it does. It does. It does. Um, it does. And then. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I would say 102 of life insurance is the different types of life insurance. Yes, yes. Right. So you have whole life insurance, you have term insurance, you have universal life, you have index universal, you have variable universal, life, you have second to die, you have corporate owned life insurance. I code. You have so many different insurance policies out there, but the reality, there's only two. Mm-hmm. You have term insurance and then you have permanent insurance. So I'm going to explain it in terms of real estate. So term insurance is like renting a place. So let's say you rent this term, this policy for 20 years. So you rent a place for 20 years. You, you pay for the 20 years. You have a place to live. Life insurance, got to you pass away. Your family get paid. But then you fast forward 20 years from now, your lease is up. Your landlord comes and says, hey, you got to get out. You can't then go to your landlord and say, hey, give me my money back. Mm. Right. They get to keep it. And now you're 21. God forbid you pass away. There's no life insurance. Yeah. So all the money you paid into it, the insurance company gets to keep it. But the trade-off is if something were to happen to you within the first 20 years, you're protected and you're covered. And that's what's known as term life insurance. Okay, 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 okay. I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. It's like you buy it for a certain amount of time. And mm-hmm. once it quote unquote runs out or expires, the deal's over. That's it. You signed a contract. Oh. It's a contract and they have to pay out. Okay. So if so, what, what's the, I don't know if like, you know, I, don't, I don't know who chooses or makes up the number, but is it like go by like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years? Or is it like a, you decide like, all right, I'm done by like age 37 or something random. Yeah, so now with all the nuances and in insurance, you can say, hey, I want to, sh- you have 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, until you're 80 years old. Um, that right? was so you have be, all those different options. Yeah, that was going to be my, my question. So if someone had term 80, you know, just yeah. someone random, um, that would mean, <laughs> <laughs> that would be, they're, they're insured, you know, and I don't know who would have that, but, you know, term, just as a um, if someone had term 80, <laughs> that would mean they're insured until they're 80. Mm-hmm. All right. For those of you out there, that's me. All right. So, so <laughs> I, I have some of that too, though. I, I have some term 80. All right. I have All some right. term 80. And I have some of the other one too. Okay. Which okay. is permanent life insurance. So this one is like buying a home. Mm. All right. So if term is like renting, permanent is like owning. Mm. so you could take out the terms let's say for 10 years 20 years 30 years let's say 20 years to keep it the same mm. so you pay your premium premium is what you pay an insurance company yeah so you could pay your policy for 20 years and then in the 20 years you're done paying but you have the insurance for the rest of your life ah so same way you could buy a house they got a 30-year mortgage pay your mortgage for 30 years and then you're you're done paying for the house you own the house for the rest of your life mm. This life insurance works the same way. So you stop paying, but you keep the insurance for the rest of your life. Okay. And, the and, that, other, and, that, and that's yeah. permanent. That's permanent. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Here's the other key part to it. So part of the permanent when you buy a house is you build equity. All right. You build equity inside this property. So inside of life insurance, you build some cash. And the cash works the same way. So now it becomes an asset, literally part of your balance sheet mm. that you get to use for other things while you are living. So there's insurance policies out there that you actually don't have to die for. 
you can literally be alive and use the money while you're still living on whatever you want. And a lot of wealthy people do it because they pay no tax mm. because it's insurance. There, there, there goes that three letter word, the tax word. Everybody, some people <laughs> love or hate it, but I know there's ways to kind of, you know, deal with the system. I, I'll use that word. There you go. The system. <laughs> I, I, I like mitigate. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There we go. There we go. That that works too. That works too. Uh, so yeah. So so you so you uh uh, uh term uh term and permanent, right? Mm-hmm. Is is there a, a whole life insurance? Is that kind of the that's part of permanent? Okay. All right. All right. All right. Just want to make sure. Yeah. So whole is for your whole whole life. Got you. So yeah. yeah. So most people like this is like me raising my hand. Um, I have both. I have term insurance. And I have permanent life insurance. Okay. The reason why I have both is because I can't afford my entire insurance policy in permanent. Mm-hmm. So I have to mix it up a little bit. Okay. 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 All right. When we speak to our wealthy clients and money isn't an issue, everything goes into permanent. Everything. Like, right. why, why rent it? It doesn't make sense. It's, it's like the, the, the way to approach it is if I'm going on vacation for the weekend. I'm going to rent the place. If I'm moving to San Diego for 10 years, 20 years, I want to buy a place. Mm, facts. So if you're going to keep it for a long time, own it. If you think you're going to die soon, you may want to rent right. it. That, that, that's, that's the weird part. That was like, That's the weird part. It's almost like in a way like you're betting like, all right, I'm probably going to be. You know, probably, yeah, I probably won't be around by then, which is kind of scary to think. It's like obviously you, you don't root to leave this earth early, but it's like, you know, do I really it's possible to be here till I'm, you know, up there in age? But you know, again, that's 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 a weird um thing to think about. But so you know what though, I want also like so damn my, my thing uh my uh I was logged in to my Northwestern account, but it logged me out right when we had the <laughs> conversation was crazy. Um but I'm still insured. So I, I, I really want to um, tap into the specifics, though. So for someone okay. out there, right, I've, I've had my insurance now for years. So like I'm, I'm good. But to provide even more perspective and context for how people can get started. Term um, 80, analyzed premium, $300, right, for, for 12 months, right? That's $25 a month. And like my, I was it called, annualized, uh, I mean, uh, net, uh, death net benefit or something like that was five, oh, you already know off the, course that's what you do. <laughs> five it's five hundred thousand dollars right so correct me if i'm wrong if i'm reading the numbers correctly i'm paying basically right 25 dollars a month and in return for lack of a better word if i were to pass away my beneficiaries would receive five hundred thousand tax free tax free for 25 dollars a month mm-hmm. correct so the reason why it's so inexpensive is because of your age, mm-hmm. you're healthy, and you smoke nothing. I imagine that's that's Fact, what happens. All those, are, all those are true. Don't worry. I'm Gucci on that side. You know, good. <laughs> Perfect. So yeah. since that's the case, if you fast forward your life 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, it's not $300 a year anymore. It's more. Now you're looking at, it's way more. You're looking at $3,000. you are looking at 5000 a year, 10000 a year, 20000 a year. It gets really, really expensive. Yeah. So you want to get as early as you possibly can. Yeah. And I still have some, like, disability, I think, income, um, too. That that's, that's even more important, especially if you're talking to young people. Yeah. Because ultimately what it comes down to is your cash flow. Right? Because right now, you're not, I don't know your pockets, but I'm not. Right? I, I'm not wealthy. Mm. Right? I, I make good income. Right? So I have cash flow coming in. But if my cash flow stops, my life is, is done. Like right. I, I, I have nothing else. Mm. So what I want to make sure is no matter what, my cash flow continues. Yeah. So it's all about cash flow planning. If you're talking to a financial advisor and they're not addressing, protecting your cash flow, the thing that's providing for everything else in your life, it's probably not a good person for you. Because yeah. how could you really have a financial plan and the one thing that's really funding your entire plan and your life is your cash flow and you don't protect it? Yeah. So that's where disability insurance comes in play because most employers will offer it to you. But if something happens to you, they only give you a percentage of your salary to be 60. Yeah. And then it's taxable. So you're down to the little, you're going from two checks a month down to one. 
So you want to supplement that. And that's why you have that disability insurance too. I'm guessing that's what your advisor told you. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what um we, we talked about and everything. Like I said, like I had it like before, you know, I was new to the game, but you know, I've had it now for, 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 for years now. And it's just been, um, but I, I, like I said, I just wanted to provide even more perspective and context for people that with it being $25 a month. And I know there's other options, right. That cost more and things like that, but I just don't want anyone to overthink it. Like you can get into life insurance for less than you buy a bottle of penny. That is not an example. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm so serious. I'm so serious. Great perspective. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm so yeah. serious. Like it's, it's not a concept again, unless I don't, there's something that I don't know, like yeah, so, five a month, like, Again, no, like I said, correct me if I'm wrong. If, if I'm missing some or there's a layer that I'm not seeing. Yeah, so know. yeah, so what you want to go from is that 25 a month to something more. Right, right. So that 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 permanent life insurance thing that I refer to, um, it's really useful because it doesn't work like the rest of the stuff that you have. And, and, and what I mean by that is that the way you structure the policy depends. You can structure this thing so many different ways. But the way I have mine policy structured it's it's guaranteed to increase in value every single year regardless of what's happening in the market is literally going up no matter what mm. the growth in the account is completely tax-free unlike my 401k my ira i don't have to wait until i'm 60 to take the money out i could take the money out whenever i want and use it for whatever i want without any taxes or penalty so as i mentioned before our family we're buying real estate now right? Three properties across two streets. Uh, the way we acquire the second property was through life insurance. The way I'm acquiring my next property out here in Pittsburgh is through my life insurance policy. Um, and the reason why I do it now is because instead of using my money that's a sitting bank account, it's better when it's in my life insurance policy because it's growing at a faster rate. It's completely tax-free. It's just as safe as the bank and I can use it for what I want. Yeah. So the way I'm going to continue growing businesses and growing my real estate portfolio is literally through my life insurance. And you don't do that 25 bucks a month. I do something a little bit more than 25. But, but remember, we, I have two. Right, right. I have my saying, term and I have my permanent. Can you do that, though, with just the, the, the permanent? So you can only do that with permanent. So term, okay. remember, you're renting, right? Uh, you don't yeah, build. Yeah, 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 you yeah, can't yeah, ask yeah. your landlord for the money back. Permanent, you can go and say, hey, I have equity in this house. And here's where... I rate of return, real estate is going to outperform life insurance. Rate of return, stocks is going to outperform life insurance. Rate of return, I think crypto will probably outperform life insurance yeah, if it continues careful. going the way it is. And that crypto community, that's what, that's what that I, crypto that's what community is dangerous. <laughs> hey, now, hey, man, it, it's, it's something special now. <laughs> it, it, it is. It is. I, I dabble in crypto. Um, yeah. I'm a fan. But it's you have to invest into really everything. Where my life insurance plays a role in all of that, because I have the stocks, I have my I have my ETFs. I don't have any bonds. Um, I have my crypto. I have real estate. I have a business. I'm continuing growing, and and I have my life insurance. Oh, yeah. So all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, here, here's here's where the life insurance literally differentiate me from so many other people and so many other investors when they strategically use it. Remember last year in March. When the market went down crazy? Oh, do I? I think, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Everybody remember? So the market went down crazy, right? And everyone that had money, what did they do? They invested. Yeah. That's the right thing to do. The market, is, everything is on sale. Mm -hmm. Guess where you can pull your money from when the market is down? Life insurance. I pull money from the life insurance. Mm. Get into the stock market, buy the bonds, the ETF, whatever you want to buy, real estate, everything is at a discount now. And when I make my money from there, I'm just going to take it out and just replenish my life insurance and keep my profits. Wow. So now instead of everyone using the same dollar once, I'm using the same dollar twice. Hmm. So okay. that's where you're able to leverage life insurance. We have clients that literally put away $20,000, $50,000, $100,000, $200,000 a year into life insurance because they're not looking at it as life insurance. It's more of a savings vehicle than anything else. So some people might start off with a small policy, pay like three grand a year, two fifty dollars a month or something like that. Like that's fine. Right. Okay. Do three grand here. Do five grand. Do six grand. Relatively speaking, right? It's a lot of money. For, right. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Relatively speaking. Um. Uh, but look, we have clients that do twenty grand, fifty grand, a hundred grand, half a mil. There are people that do a million dollars a year into life insurance, mm. and it's not shocking, because all you're literally doing is you're putting the money away so you can use it again. 
but not using know. the same dollar, not once, but twice. Yeah, because they know, you know what I'm saying, what, you know, it's coming after. They're, 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 there's a plan behind it. But so that's, you know, that's interesting, too, because originally when I got into life insurance, like I said, just term 80, it was for only life insurance. Like it was just to make sure, like, my family was straight, you know, with, with the worst case scenario. But now you're talking about possibly investing with the life insurance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's okay. a, yeah, yeah. It's huge. It's huge. And the reason why I have term insurance and it's not all permanent yet is because, excuse me, based on my budget and how much I'm able to save, I have enough permanent life insurance. Like, I don't, I don't want to put another dime more <laughs> than I'm doing right now into life insurance. But I know my income, knock on wood, is going to continue growing. Mm-hmm. And as my income continues to grow, I'm going to take my term insurance and I'm going to exchange it in and get some more permanent so I could contribute more into it. So okay. you can start off with term and then over time switch it to the permanent. Well, see, that's it. That's it. You use the word switch. I was getting ready to ask. I know you said you can do both. Um, but so is there like a, a time limit or a cutoff? Like if someone has like term insurance, uh, can they just, yeah. you know, start tomorrow and say, all right, I also want permanent or do they have to yeah. choose one or the other? Most people own a mix of both. So right, well, when we meet with a family and it's like, hey, husband and wife they have a couple of kids and they need I don't know, $2 million of life insurance, like whatever the number, um, to cover all their stuff. Well, we're going to say, hey, let's rent 1.5 of it and let's own 500 of it. Ah, okay. So now you still have your $2 million, but we can't afford all $2 million of permanent because the price of that is going to be way too high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we could afford 500 of it in permanent and let's rent the other 1.5. Okay, okay, right. okay, okay, I'm with you, I'm with you. To, to use, if it was a million dollar need and you're going you're to buy a million dollar life insurance policy, you can say, hey, I want to rent 80% of it and I own 20% of it. So for a young person, like your term policy, 500,000 is 25 bucks a month. A million dollars is $50 a month, mm. right? If you want a million dollar permanent life insurance, you're talking about $1,000 a month. Mm. And not all young people want to put $1,000 a month away into any vehicle. Right. right. Especially, even if the name especially if they like can't, insurance. especially if they can't touch it, like or get it back immediately. Exactly. Right. That delayed gratification isn't there. So they could say, "Hey, you know, what? I can't do a thousand a month right now, but you know, I could do two fifty. So you know, I could do two fifty. I'll rent two hundred of it. I mean, I'll, I'll rent eight hundred of it. So that might be like forty dollars a month, and then I own two hundred of it, and that'd be like two hundred a month. Okay. Two hundred plus the forty. Now you have like two fifty, and okay. that's your mix for now. But young people, we grow. We make more money. We progress in our lives and our careers. And as you make more money, we can go from two fifty a month to five hundred a month to a thousand a month. You're gonna grow into that thousand a month policy. Mm. I mean, it seems like it may be a lot, like a sticker shock to a lot of people now. But just I kid you not, so many people do it every single day. Yeah. At you're we're just not exposed to it. It came down to the beginning of our conversation being exposed to it. Mm. I've seen two black males in my life wear suits K through twelve. Two. I wasn't that exposed to it, but those two that I saw showed me that was possible. So now we're starting to see other people where it's like, hey, you know what? I have X amount of life insurance. Um, I have $6 million of life insurance. I put 20000 in my permanent. Like when people start talking like that, yeah, yeah. next time someone says, hey, I have life insurance and I say put two fifty a month into it. So I'm like, oh my God, I paid $10 <laughs> for mine. Like, why do you do that? It's like, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, that, but that's important though. You know, I'm, I'm going to tell you this though. I'm probably going to make a, a couple of calls this week though. And, 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 <laughs> And no, no, I'm, I'm sick. Because like I said, when I first got into insurance, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, take care of the fame. But now it's like, all right. That's it. The permanent sounds like there's some, you know, some which, which I already knew ahead of time. But just like everyone, I'm sure, you know, when you first um, get started in life insurance, it's almost like, all right. Just like investing in the stock market. Like anything you do for the first time, it's like, all right, let me let me try it out. You know, let me see what let it's like. Dabble. Yeah, let me right, dabble. No. All right. All right, I lose my money. All right, cool. It's still there? All right, cool. I went to sleep. Still got my money? All right, cool. Now we can... Uh, but even going off that, though, that's why I say it's just so important, as you mentioned, for young people, you know, to to, to get um, started with it, you know, like, and I'm not even a financial advisor, but I just think that, again, everyone, like, nobody knows what's, like, what's going to happen tomorrow. And also, too, talk to me, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but, like, GoFundMes, like, mm-hmm. do you think that's a problem, not a problem, but do you think that's something that has been so popular within our community of people having to use GoFundMe and stuff, having life insurance. Cause that's nothing too. When someone, when your beneficiary or whatever receives your money, you, can they just do whatever they want or does it go to like funeral costs or whatever? But 
I just want to talk about GoFundMe just if this is an alternative for that. Yeah. Um, I I'm gonna be I'm gonna speak on the positive side. Yeah. From my experience and what I see based on my news feed, mm-hmm. I see less and less GoFundMe's for funerals. So shout out to us. All right, quick little shout out. I think that's a really good thing. Yeah. Where a couple of years, a few years ago, I think it was way more prominent in our community to continue using GoFundMe. Um, so the fact that we're getting away from that, and I think more and more, I hope this is true, uh, of us are buying more life insurance in lieu of waiting on the community to come around and, and save us, really, and our families. I completely agree that life insurance is a completely way better alternative than GoFundMe. The money they guys raise on, Go, on, on the GoFundMe is if you literally would have put a fraction of that into life insurance policy, you would have got multiples of it. The way I think we're going to be able to close our wealth gap, the biggest tool is going to be life insurance, in my opinion, yeah. right? And it doesn't all have to come from one company. It can be all the companies out there. This is literally just pure education. Every young person in my family has life insurance. Nieces, nephews, siblings, as soon as they're born, boom, life insurance. Every single person. Mm-hmm. And I got this idea from my mentor, shout out to Tim Radden. He, oh, he's an OG. He had dinner with one of the Kennedys and they're at dinner and he started talking to them about legacy planning. This is the Kennedys. And he said, um, he was so fascinated by the conversation. He went to Boston where they have the famous Kennedy library. Mm-hmm. And if you go into the Kennedy library, every single room in there is named after Kennedy, mm-hmm. except for one. And he's like, who is this one person that made it into this famous Kennedy library that's not a Kennedy? And what he found out after doing research is that the person that's there is the Kennedy's family life insurance agent. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. here's what he discovered. Here's, here's what the Kennedys do. Whenever a baby is born, they'll buy the biggest life insurance policy they could buy on that infant. And you fast forward, when that infant passes away, they'll get a lump sum of money, right? It's life insurance, right? You take this infant, they turn 80 years old, whatever. They pass away, you get a lump sum of money. What they then do is they buy what's known as a single premium life insurance policy. Single premium means you're paying the premium once. So the next Kennedy that's born, they take that lump sum of money and they put it they buy a life insurance policy one time on that new baby. Fast forward to that baby turns 80 years old <laughs> and they pass away. So now you're at a 160 year cycle now. Just recycle. You know, all this stuff. So now when that happens, they haven't spent a dime, right? They haven't spent a dime. And then when they get that money now, now they start living on the interest. So that's a, huh, let me humor myself. So I go in our system and I ran a life insurance quote. And I created an infant, zero-year-old female. And I say, you know what? What if I just put away $5,000 a year away into the life insurance for an infant at zero? And I killed them at age 80. Sounds very morbid, but just... Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I didn't, I didn't react. Right. I'm with you, man. I'm right. with you. Go. Cool. So I did it. And then at age 80, I looked at the number. You want to guess what the number is? From, from five? Like from, from, from five thousand a year until they're eighty, from, age from, zero to age eighty. Uh, is there oh, is there a percent interest on it? You're saying it has to be. Yeah, it has to grow. I'm I'm scared to guess. I, all right, well, from 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 all right, from when they're born, five thousand dollars a year to when they're eighty, to they're eighty years old. Anyway, the the coverage amount ends up being seven and a half million dollars. You then take seven and a half million dollars. And you put a single premium onto a new baby. And this is literally what I did in our system. And I fast forward to age 80. And then, again, I killed the baby. And I said, okay, what's the coverage amount at that time? And it was $295 million. That was not the number I was going to guess. $295 million. And that's from $5,000 a year for one generation. And then just take a lump sum and put it to the next generation. And what I assure you, the Kennedys put away more than five thousand dollars a year. Yeah, into life insurance. If, if I had to guess, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but, but all of that stays in what's known as a dynasty trust. So now you're removing the human error from it. Mm-hmm. So now no one can mess this up. It's not a business that could fade away. 
right? It's not like the steel that could fade away over time, right? It's not like my father trucking business. He's doing great, but I may die out in 50, 100 years. Like, yeah. I don't think that, I don't know, right? It's mm-hmm. literally a bag of cash that's passing from one generation to the next. The trust owns the policy. All the infant does, they're simply just born. Just that's just all live. it takes. Just live. Just live. The longer you live, the better payoff is going to be for the family. So now if you notice, what the Kennedys do, they all do whatever they want. They're all in philanthropy. That's all they wanted. That was their vision. Papa Kennedy's vision is that I want my family to do whatever they want. You're going to give back to the good and service. So he actually had dinner with that lady at a charity event. And that's when he learned all this stuff. Yeah. And the way he got there is because he's an OG and he could write a check for 50 grand or 100 grand and have dinner with the Kennedys. Just, you know, just dinner. Just, you know, six, they figured dinner, nothing wrong with that. Not mad at it. You know? No. But that's, but but that's, that's we can't. That cycle, that's, though. You know, that's mm-hmm. that's that to me, obviously, when we talk numbers, you know, that, that that's what, you know, gets people. You know, that's what catches people's attention. Um, right. but me, the, the part that stuck with me in that story is the cycle that was established by someone. Like, And, and you know, your last name is more of like a oh, I'm going to pass this down to the next person and then they're going to learn how to do it. And then they're going to pass it down to the next person over and over again. So. And here's the best part about it. They don't have to learn nothing. It's mm. all in writing. Like, this is going to live in perpetuity. The trust owns it. I don't own the policy. You don't own the policy. The trust owns the policy. The trust is the beneficiary. The trust is the payer. The only thing you have to do is just be born. You're just being shirt. When we start doing things like that in our community, and that's going to be the vision for my family unit as we continue to grow. Mm -hmm. You just kind of, they don't have to do anything. They don't have to do anything additional. Just not not for money. Just I, I I be an African um, from West Africa. You already know if you're African, you're going to college. You're going to be an engineer. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to go in business. Like that's it. Like that's that's as flexible yeah, yeah. as it's going to be. Um, yeah, you got to listen to my kids. You, you got you got to listen to a uh, Sonny's episode too. He kind of I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we got. Like engineer, I gotta be a doctor. I gotta do a business. Like, what are you gonna do? It's like, you're making this very hard. I got three options. Like, that's all I had. Yeah. So my sister, she's a nurse. Like, it's every. It was like healthcare, engineer, or business. That's yeah. it. But, we, but, we couldn't. We couldn't say I want to do performance, performing arts. Like, mm-hmm. my, my father would kill if I said <laughs> I was going to major in. No offense to anyone out there, right, psychology, right, right. sociology, art. Or mm. anything that was, oh, I just have a passion for this. Right. And I'd, I'd love for that. If I was a financial planner, I'd be a social worker. Mm. I say that every time because I love helping people and I love caring for people. I just didn't have that as a choice. I had to choose oh. business. Oh, oh, so oh, I'd, oh, I'd, oh. Well, fortunately, you like it now. So, I mean, you know, it's not that good. And now I like it. Yeah, that's right. a good thing. Right. I gave me three thing. options and I like one of them. Yeah, so, that, that, then it worked out. No, but I hope my kids could go to the school of their choice. And I hope that my kids would say, hey, you know what? I love art so much. I want to go study Picasso. Mm. Maybe not Picasso, but yeah, but somebody just, else. Like, well, right. this, just the, I think the idea too right. is like when we talk about generational wealth and all that. I think in legacy planning, I think it's so important, um, like to provide your children with, I guess, options or you know the be the ability to to kind of choose, um, you know, not necessarily um, certain things being forced. Um, yeah. But one thing too that I wanted to ask you, man. Um, it's the final question for you. Um, yep. And it's a question that I ask everyone that's been on an episode of Defying Legacy. And that question is, um, how do you want to be remembered? Yeah. Um, so when I was 19 years old and I did my, my vision board, what I told myself and what I wrote down is when I go, whenever that is, uh, actually before I go, hopefully I'm still alive for it. I want to go back to Togo, Africa, and I'm going to open up a soup kitchen. Mm. And the soup kitchen is going to incorporate a farm where we can hire people to work on the farm to earn some extra money. Same time we feed the community for free. Mm. It's just a passion of mine. And that's something I'm going to do. And that's outside of like family, but that's just something I'm really passionate about. Um, The two things, and my lady and I, uh, we had a conversation about this recently, where what we're doing is we're literally just focusing on the things that we care about the most. And for us, it's hunger and education. Mm. If any type of charity has to do any of those two things, it's like we're, we're in. 
Mm. So next year, we're doing our, our budget of things we're going to give away next year. And we're thinking about, okay, what charities are aligned with hunger and education? And that's exactly where we're going to put our focus mm. because you're going to have so many th- different things to choose from. That makes it very difficult. So part of that legacy is I personally want to be remembered for going back home, having that soup kitchen with the, ki- uh, with the farm to feed the community, and then something around education and hunger here in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's real. Um, and, you know, too, whenever I ask people that question, um, I, I, I hope, I never ask this, but I hope that their answer or response isn't even related to money. You know, um, yeah. and it sounds like obviously what you um, just gave is, is, is just that, you know, we talk about hunger and education, um, you know, because this world is just bigger than us, you know, and right. you know, the, the impact and the value that you can provide for people um, is really limitless, man. So definitely um, salute to you on that. Um, but if you could, man, if, if, if you want, you're interested in, um, feel free if you want um, to drop your social media or email, wherever people can find you. If people have any questions, want to become a future client, whatever the case may be, by all means, um, run with the, the, the marketing and promo. Yeah. Uh, so Bilal Afalabi, um, literally same name everywhere. So if you Google Bilal Afalabi, you can see me. My Instagram handle is Bilal Afalabi. LinkedIn, Bilal Afalabi. Facebook, Bilal Afalabi. Email is Bilal.Afalabi at N- <laughs> at nm.com uh but i'm pretty easy to get a hold of dm me message me email me like not that hard to get a hold of um and i'm pretty responsive for sure for sure man well again man thank you um again just for the you know this episode it definitely um was an important one you know i i would say it was definitely definitely an important one it was dope to hear your story um again we talk about um you know, insurance and everything, you know, getting your money right, everything like that. Um, so again, y'all, you know, I'm following Define Legacy on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Um, just like that, we out.